Okay, so we're going to get started here. This is 10.3, Sedimentary Rock. Uh, sedimentary Rock is, uh, is one of the fun ones uh, because it's gone through uh, a lot. What am I saying? They're all fun. Uh, but basically, uh, it's rock that's gone through a change. All right, so what you're going to be able to do uh, after today, name the three main types of sedimentary rock. You're going to be able to give examples of each. Um, and then uh, you're going to be able to describe features with sedimentary rock. And, and my feelings are um, this should be fairly easy as we go through this. shouldn't be too terribly difficult. Um, and so you should be, uh, should be pretty, pretty straightforward. All right, first of all, when we get a bunch of material that sits on top of itself, it's called compaction. So this is no different than if, um, if we are having a bunch of material that um, either falls down uh, off of a mountain, erodes away, whatever. But the more and more material that comes down, it causes an increase in pressure. The increase in pressure then forces out everything that's in there. The air bubbles, the, the, the particles, the everything. And so, um, for me, it makes a lot of sense that when we, when we find sedimentary rock, you know, there's not a lot of air spaces in there. Um, because they've all been worked out. Now, one of the things that's cool about this is if you add some chemicals to it, um, what ends up happening either through the evaporation of water or through minerals that have come in there and then the water has been evaporated or uh, we see different particles of other substances that have been uh, washed away what happens is it becomes a solid. It becomes cemented, right? And so um, cementation is something that we've taken advantage of as humans, right? So if you think about it, if you think about it, um, we figured out how to replicate nature by adding things into a mix. So we have gravel, we have sand, and we have lime and other chemicals and you mix them up and spread them with water and pretty soon you got cement. And so um, cementation uh, is a part of sedimentary rock. Okay, so what happens is we see pieces come together. Now, when we have a company that has bits and pieces, so for example, if I'm using a company like, uh, oh, I don't know, AT&T or uh, Mediacom. How many of you guys have Mediacom, right? Mediacom used to be a lot of little cable companies. AT&T used to be a lot of little telephone companies. And so when we have a lot of pieces, we call it a conglomerate. So AT&T was a conglomerate. Uh, uh, Mediacom's a conglomerate. They basically are made up of little, little baby bells or uh, little cable companies. And so a conglomerate is when we have fragments that are um, cemented together and they're easily seen. So. So for the people who are listening to this uh, on the VOD, you can't see this, obviously. But what I'm doing is I'm going to hold up and I'm going to pass this around. Uh, I call this my Rice Krispie Treat. This is not a Rice Krispie Treat. Uh, this is a piece of sandstone that was, that I found. I find, you know, it's, it's bad because every time we go on vacation, I go and grab rocks, right? We're, we're all... We're taking family photos and this and that. I'm, I'm down picking up rocks and putting them in my pocket and walking around like I can't walk anymore. But uh, this is one that I picked up. Uh, this is a sandstone conglomerate. Um, but what you can see is it's not really sand. It's bits and pieces of shell. This is another conglomerate um, that has big, big pieces of coral. I'll pass that around. Again, this is sandstone. I'm sorry. 
This one here is limestone. The other one is sandstone. Now, when we talk about a conglomerate, we're talking about big pieces, right? This is a piece of limestone that does not have big pieces in it, right? We don't see big chunks. It's not a conglomerate. This is a piece that we definitely see big chunks in. This is a conglomerate, right? So we see the big chunks. You can see the bits and pieces. It looks like you can pick them off there. Now, when we see the individual fragments are broken, right? They're not round, right? So if you look in those pieces, they're angular. That particular piece has no, is not a conglomerate. It does not have broken pieces, right? They're not round. We call it a breccia or a breccia. Depends on your pronunciation. I've always called it a breccia. Um, I know a lot of people call them breccias. But basically what we're dealing with is round not round angles, okay? Sandstone. Sandstone uh, is the one that, uh, we'll pass this one around. <coughs> so these are two forms of sandstone. Notice uh, in these sandstones, again, it's made of sand and it's all cemented together. It doesn't fall apart. Now, sandstone, is one of those that again has a large amount of quartz in it. Why? Because sand is quartz, predominantly quartz, right? And so we see a lot of sandstone associated with areas that used to have a beach. Makes a sense, right? Now, here's an interesting thing. Sandstone's one of those items that if you put water on, it'll flow pretty much through it. Why? Because there's spaces between them. All right, so again, that's limestone, that's a conglomerate. Sandstone, because the particles, so the sand particles are pushing each other away and there's spaces in between it so water can flow through. Or in this case, a lot of times we found crude oil in, in that same situation. Like with this one right here, Gavin, this rock that you have in your hand, there's a lot of spaces in between, that's a sandstone, and basically that particles can get in between there, okay? Um, the shales are pretty straightforward, right? So, by the way, in this picture on the left, that's this rock right here. Um, this is a conglomerate, the sandstone, obviously particles of sand, and that one was back there. I don't know where it's at right now. Shale. Shale is easy. Shale is a clay that's been pressed and cemented and hardened, right? And so basically what happens is it's pressed, pushed down, um, and, and basically it's clay that has been compacted. Again, it's hard. You can't pull it apart. Um, easy to uh, figure it out because they have those darker colors. It's usually very flat, very flat. And again, you can see this on uh, 182, 183 in your book, but uh, shales are pretty easy. Um, interestingly enough, they also are doing uh, uh, finding oil in oil shales, and they're extracting oil out of that. Uh, I don't know if you... Uh, is that fracking? Uh, no, fracking is when they put, they find a fracture, and they shove water or sand or hot water or material down into salt water sometimes into a fissure or a crack to expand the joint and then when it does it allows them to extract it easier unfortunately there's unintended consequences with that when you're shoving water down into a crack like that it can cause this lubrication like we're seeing in Oklahoma and we're seeing more earthquakes it can cause pollution as well so but fracking um, 
when they mine oil shale and uh, 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 oil sands, what they're doing is they're strip mining it and they're they're bulldozing it out. So in this diagram, I love this diagram. In this diagram, you see we have a big uh, uh, rainstorm up at Mount Ritter, and what happens is we see erosion taking place as it does. All the material that was from up at the higher elevation is now being deposited in the mouth of the river. Over time, that mouth of the river is elongating. It's also being deposited on the floor of the, the lake or the ocean or the sea here. And so what's happening is we're seeing time and pressure build up and we're making sedimentary rock. So a lot of times we'll see sedimentary rock associated with the ocean or um, areas around a large body of water, right? All right, chemical sedimentary rock. When we're dealing with chemical sedimentary rock, we are dealing with rock that is made from chemicals that are in the water. Chemicals that are made in the uh, that are in the water. Sedentary rocks, we see um, when chemical is in there, the water dissolves out. So a mineral of some sort is in there. The water dissolves out. And, and when it does, we see something come out of it. So in a lot of cases, we see what's called a precipitate. So in precipitates, we're seeing something settle out of the water. How many of you uh, at home, every once in a while, and I'm not asking you to raise your hand, just give me a nod, we'll see that around the, the faucet, your faucet, you'll see a white layer around the edge uh, that's called lime scale or lime. So the, we, are per, we are prone to it in Livingston County because we're on top of limestone. All of our water is coming from the limestone. So we're seeing hard water as a result. We're seeing a lot of lime in the water. And so what happens is water evaporates. It's leaving behind the lime, and it's creating this lime scale. So that's why we have, in Pontiac have a lot of people who have water softeners, right? They don't want the lime scale. Or you deal with it by cleaning your, your, your faucets off with vinegar and stuff like that. Um, this would be a precipitate. The lime scale would be a precipitate comes out of the water. Lime is also something that binds stuff together. So this is something that we see in cement. We'll talk about cement in a minute. Evaporates. Um, and so like gypsum or halite, we use, we saw this in our mineral, right? In minerals, gypsum and halite, rock salt, good <coughs> examples. Um, how many of you are familiar with the crystal cave? How many of you have seen the crystal cave? Crystal cave, you haven't? None of you? Um, let's see if I got it here. The crystal cave is quite interesting. Um, it's gypsum. And this is a giant cave and co that they discovered. And Hi, this is Landy Clark. Today we're going to explore one of the most incredible caves uh, in the entire world. In fact, this cave is very much like one of the caves that we've all seen in the movies in Hollywood. Uh, the, the movie Superman, in several of the movies you'll see scenes in this crystal cave where Superman has this unbelievable uh, information that's uh, inside the crystals. Well, there actually is a crystal cave that's very much like the movies. Uh, it's in uh, Mexico. It's in uh, on the plateau uh, near uh, Chihuahua. Mexico, and it's about a thousand feet underground. So you really have to travel a thousand feet underground just to find this cavern. But when you get down there, you will find the most incredible pieces of crystal that you've ever seen in your entire life. I mean, we're talking gigantic size pillars of crystal. 
and this is selenite crystal uh, and uh, incredible I mean the, the views that you get inside this cabin are just uh, absolutely spectacular uh, you'll see ca uh, uh, some of these uh, crystal uh, pillars that are so huge that it's just absolutely mind-boggling uh, when you think of the weight because some of these are as much as 55 tons and to think that these all started from literally a crystal that was the size of a grain of salt and grew for 500,000 years in this cavern. Now this main cavern here uh, is just incredible. I mean some of these are over three stories tall. I mean this is just incredible to imagine what it would be like inside uh, this cavern to take a look at these crystals uh, and just unbelievable they're all over the place and they go in virtually every direction of the cave some are growing you know sideways some are growing up into the ceiling some are growing from the ceiling down into the ground now this is one of the offshoots here this is a little uh, cave that's inside the main cavern uh, nearby the main cavern where those crystals are this is called the, the cave of swords and it literally is, it looks like thousands of swords coming out of the walls in this little cave. Uh, so incredible sight there. Uh, but these crystals are absolutely, you know, uh, incredible in terms of the size. Because there's no crystals on earth that, are, that even compare to the size of the crystals that are inside uh, this cavern. I mean, you can clearly see this looks like ice cubes. Uh, but these are real crystal uh, and just incredible. The quality of the crystal in some of the areas here is just off the charts. Uh, and the size is just, you know, monumental when you look at this. Uh, just incredible to think that humans are down taking a look at this because this is a very hostile environment uh, where this is located. Again, it's a thousand feet underground. And uh, in this location, the average temperature is about 122 degrees. And uh, on top of that, this whole environment here in this cavern was, uh, was underwater. So literally, this is a very hostile environment. Everyone has to suit up in special suits. Uh, you can walk around in your normal clothes, but you can only handle the heat for about five or 10 minutes, and, uh, and then you better be getting back into the cooler environments. So they have to suit up. Everyone has to be monitored, uh, and everyone's watched to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, that they keep their core temperature down at a, at a, uh, a relatively cool uh, temperature for the area. But uh, these are just incredible uh, pieces of crystal. Again, it's selenite crystal. Uh, some of these things are absolutely uh, gigantic in size again and they're very uh, unique in terms of uh, they're sharp uh, I mean you literally fall on one of these crystals you could literally cut yourself they're, they're razor sharp in certain areas so the bottom line is you have these huge giant crystals in this cavern that is that was discovered in 2000 it was only discovered about 13 years ago uh, in 2007 they came in and did an exploration and then again in 2010 now this entire cave was underwater, the whole cavern, and they had to pump out all the water just to take a look at this stuff. Uh, they have pumps that pump out a million gallons of water per hour. So the bottom line is you have these incredible crystals in, uh, in this cavern. They're underground a thousand feet under the earth in Mexico, and today I believe it's all underwater. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but from what I can gather, uh, they probably turned off the pumps, and I'm sure this whole thing is filled up again unless they're exploring it again. Uh, but from what I understand, they were not going to be doing any explorations after that uh, last expedition in, in 2010. But incredible story, incredible crystals. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching. So, again, uh, it is flooded. Um, it's it's incredible the the process that is going on, and these evaporates uh, are a good example of that. Then we have organic sedimentary rock. Now, organic sedimentary rock is quite easy, um, and it's something that you're exposed to every day. And what I mean by that is, limestone is a great organic sedimentary rock. We have limestone here um, all over. It's not something that's unusual. We mine it in South County. Um, I think pretty much it stops right. Does it go? Up? Do they have uh, um, rock? Do they have limestone quarries in Dwight? I don't think they do. Yeah, it's it's pretty much. So our area is kind of a freak of nature. So what happens is, and I don't know if you, uh, I'll draw this. Nobody can see this uh, while they listen to it, but I'll draw it up. If we were to take the state of Illinois, and this being Chicago up here, this being Pontiac, this being Chinoa, 
and we go down, basically what happens is this. The limestone comes up to the surface uh, in the Pontiac area. It, it, it very close, like in my house, it's five feet. Um, um, we, it, was so, it was so high at my house that when we were going to put our basement into our house, we could not dig down. So instead of digging down, what we decided to do is go up. And then I brought dirt around the outside of my house, so I have a walkout basement um, because we could not drill into the into the limestone. It was so close to the surface. Um, so limestone comes uh, the St. Petersburg limestone comes to the surface, uh, uh, Shinoa area. Once you get past Shinoa area, it takes a dive down again. So Shinoa, Weston, Fairbury, um, that area, Pontiac prime territory for being able to access limestone quarries, right? Uh, and limestone. What do they use it for? They use it for gravel. They use it for spreading ag lime on the field. Um, another one is coal. Um, and it's the organic sedimentary rock here. It's collects has that around. Take a look at it. Don't lick it. Um, we have another couple pieces. You can snip it. If I ever burn this for you, if I burn coal for you, no. I'll burn some coal for you today in a little bit. So basically, coal is, so do you guys all understand fossil fuels? Fossil fuels, let's take, let's take oil and natural gas out of it. Now we're dealing with coal. Coal is the remains of a woody swamp. Okay, the remains of a woody swamp. Just do me a favor, try not to break it too much. Um, interestingly enough, uh, our area is also a mecca for coal. You guys all understand that underneath Pontiac right here is a giant coal mine, right? Yeah, there's a, the, the entrance is the old Peanut Hill, the, the pond over here behind uh, Elm Street. Um, coal mines were big. In Illinois, coal mines in southern Illinois are big. We have a lot of coal because we were the edge of we were the edge of a swamp to the ocean some 150 million years ago, right? And so what we see, what we see is that the coal is there uh, and it'll come to the surface. So, for example, this coal that I have here, if I, uh, I go over to a golf tournament over in Pekin. And uh, over there, it's actually in Barton. Uh, 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 it's actually in Limestone, the town of Limestone. Anyhow, um, so go over there, um, and there's an exposed seam of coal on the golf course that they had used for a, a coal mine that was a strip mine. And so instead of refixing it, they made it into a golf course. So they've got an exposed seam that they didn't get at all. So every once in a while, I'll take my golf cart and I'll drive off into the woods and I'll grab coal and everybody's like, where did he go? I know, it's, it's kind of odd. And they, they've kind of got to know me pretty well by now. They're like, oh, he's going to get coal. Um, and, and it's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> so um, coal, again, is carbon that is not decayed. It's been compressed. Um, um, I say I said that wrong. It's plants that have been decayed, but it's carbon that's been compressed uh, and, and compacted. Same thing with limestone. Okay, stratification. Stratification just means layers. Layers. And I don't have my favorite rock. Remind me to bring my favorite rock into school tomorrow on Friday. Um, now, when we talk about stratification, all we're talking about is a layering of the rock or a cross bedding. Um, so, if we look at cross bedding, This is what that means. So in this particular image, this one will do. 
this particular image, what we have here is we have a rock that at one time was sand. And what is happening here is wind is blowing and depositing sands like in a, in a sand dune. How many of you ever seen that before? Sand dunes? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. You, we, can even, we can even talk about snow drifts, right? I love watching snow drifts a little bit. So what happens is the wind deposits the sand. So this area right here, right? All this area is one deposit. This area here is a deposit. This area here is a deposit, deposit, deposit. And this might be millions and millions of years, right? But what's happening is it's depositing this in different ways. So the wind was blowing in a different direction. And as it was, it's now causing us to see different graining, and we call that cross bedding. Okay? So cross bedding. Everybody good with stratification? Mm -hmm. Pretty easy. Cross bedding. Ripple marks. <laughs> this is not what happens when you're in the bathtub. Ripple marks. Um, basically what happens, and I know you've all seen this, but we're talking about waves uh, that cause the action on sand underwater. All right, here we go. So sand underwater, uh, ripple marks, real easy. Every one of you have seen this. Uh, basically, it is areas that were underwater at one point in time, and the ripple marks have been left in the sand, and the sand has then been hardened in sedimentary rock and what we see is ripple marks. Now I've got a one of my favorite um, favorite rocks is uh, a rock that has ripple marks on it. Now um, to, to give you the backstory on this I'll just leave it there for a minute. To give you the backstory on this rock and I'll bring it in I, I, like I said earlier, my family and I, we like to go riding four-wheelers and stuff like that, and we go riding all over the place. We were up in Tennessee on top of a mountain at about three or 4,000 feet above elevation. Maybe more like three. I don't really know. Right? It wasn't a mile high. So we're at like 3,000 feet elevation on top of a mountain riding our four-wheelers, and I come across a rock like this in this picture. And it's about the size of, you know, uh, my my seat on my quad and so I jump off everybody's like thinking I'm a freak I jump off grab I, I'm not a freak I jump off <coughs> grab the rock put it on my seat I sit down on top of the rock and I ride this rock off the top of the top of the mountain now the first thing I do when I get off I'm like yeah like Indiana Jones I found it and everybody's like what's wrong with you why was I so excited about this rock the reason I was is because I had found a ripple rock on top of a mountain. What did that mean? So, yeah, this rock, which was at sea level, or at least at, at level of a lake of some sort, had been, nobody took that rock up there. Nobody goes, hey, I'll bet you five bucks we can get this really crazy science guy who's down there on uh, on the Suzuki to come up top of here. He'll freak out. We'll just place it here right in the middle. He'll find it. And he'll freak out. It'll be awesome. That didn't happen, right? This rock went naturally got there through elevation. It went from zero to three or four thousand feet. I get excited when I can see that. And so what did I do? I brought it home. Right? Yeah. Yeah, probably shouldn't have brought it home, but I did. <coughs> All right, mud crack. This is not something you can sell. Um, um, this is uh, this is when we have a muddy area that dries out. 
This is a piece of mud crack. Please do not drop this because somebody dropped it on me. I, uh, I want you to see them, but I don't want you to break them. They're my pets. It's not really a pet, I guess. They're my <coughs> treasures. My wow. treasures. So here's Your mud crack. What happened is there's a piece of mud that dried out. As it did, it started to contract. And what you have is a piece of mud that is a rock now. So you can pass that around. Again, Mud crack. So again, it's just like what you think. Mud crack. But it becomes a hard rock again. Evaporation of the water causes a contraction as it does. We see it harden or solidify mud crack. Just that simple. Any hard with that? Any, any problems with that one? Mud crack? I like saying it. Mud crack. John, do you have a question? Not a question, but if you look in like older TV shows, like older animated TV shows, like Howard, uh, Curse of Cowardly Dog. When they indicated a dry land, they hit the uh, mud crack. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Mud crack, you see a lot. Y yeah, you're right. Fossils. Again, with fossils, they're the ancient remains. Now, we have different ways of looking at fossils. Somebody's got the uh, sandstone. It's got the, the big gastropod in it. Where is that at? piece of sandstone that has a shell of a snail in it. All right, yeah, yeah, gastropod. So that, that's a fossil. I'll turn it on. Uh, would you hold that up for me? Right. You can see that. Um, hold up the other piece that you have. That also has fossils in it, right? Easy to see. Fossils are pretty good, uh, pretty good examples. Now, uh, no, you're not done. Hold that back up. Right? What's different about the two fossils that he has in his hand? What do you see? Yeah. One has the object and the other one's just the shell. One one's the object, the other one is an impression of the object. Right? So really we have two things when we talk about fossils. We talk about the fossil and then we talk about the cast of the fossil. I've got uh, uh I got another couple of fossils uh, that I'll send around. Um, I don't know where they're at, but um, again, I think it's pretty easy. You can make your own fossil, if you will. Find an object, make a cast. There you go. Um, we do this, by the way, in one of the classes that I teach by using plaster of Paris and, and making casts of imprints of animals. Uh, a concretion. A concretion uh, or a geode concretion. Iron concretions. I have an iron concretion right here. All right. So here are two iron concretions. By the way, we're known, renowned in the world for iron concretions. Um, they're from uh, uh, Mazan. Mazan is like the world's greatest place for these things. So basically what you do is you go find a round rock like this in, up in Mazan. And the trick is you go stick them in a bucket of water. And then you go place them in the freezer. And they go because the water seeps through and it breaks them open. And you get inside of there, there's ferns. And I'll pass that around. Um, these, are, these, are just, these are just ferns you can see. Uh, these are concretions. Here you go. Pass it around. But what's cool about it is something caused a buildup of the minerals around this particle. In this case, they are ferns. Um, same thing, geode. How many of you guys have ever seen a geode? Right? My favorite things, geodes. What's happening here? It's a sedimentary rock. We're seeing material or chemicals being deposited inside of a hole. The water then evaporates away. As the water evaporates away, so you can see in this particular one right here, there's a cavity 
right? That cavity was filled with water. Obviously, there was a mineral in there that was blue as it evaporated away. We've got this beautiful blue eye uh, geode. I, I love this. this is a Brazilian geode. Here, you can pass it around. Yeah, I, lo I love geodes. Um, by the way, real big money in geodes. If you want to buy some really cool pieces of rock, yeah. At my, at my grandpa's house, um, there used to be this geode where it was, it looked just like a closed rock. Yeah. Well, you can see the side of it, there's a bunch of quartz sticking out from That's really cool. I said that one. That is really cool. Okay, we're going to stop here. Um, yeah. We're going to also stop and we're going to look at some rock boxes. So we'll stop here. Sorry. I appreciate you doing that. Uh,